Welcome, ladies and gents. I'm Dan the Man Munoz, host of Movie Menu Interviews, where we interview up and coming filmmakers to discuss their films from idea to completion. On today's episode, we'll be interviewing filmmaker Landon Coates of Broken Bottle Films. I would like to welcome Landon Coates to the show. Hey. Thank you so Thank much you guys. for being here. Thank you for having me. It means a whole lot. Great. Also here is my co-host, Mike Stan. Hey. Thanks, Mike. How's it going? Uh, so the basic reason why we do this show is to discuss the process for future filmmakers out there who might be listening to talk about what worked for you on your film projects, what you would change for your next project, and any advice you'd like to give to our listeners while making films. So Landon, if you want to go ahead and just give a background on yourself, where you grew up, and how you got interested in filmmaking? Absolutely. So I grew up in Texas, moved out here senior year of high school. I subconsciously knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker, but it, it's like not really an artsy state. So there's not much. <laughs> Texas? Uh, yeah, no, yeah. You, you can't imagine that. But, it, you know, it's growing. You know, Austin and everything like that. It's starting to become more like that. And so growing up, I like I collected movies and just had like a bunch of them. And my parents were like, this is really weird. Like, <laughs> Wait, what kind of movies were you collecting? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, no, I... Like just anything. No, I was too scared of horror films. I'm actually more recently <laughs> getting into those. Um, but it was like, at first it was like comedies. So like Hot Rod was really important to me. So I tried to find more movies oh, that, that made me feel that way. And then I would start watching more and more and more. And then finally I was into Charlie Sheen at the time because I really liked Two and a Half Men. It was just around the time of all that really weird controversy. And in like high school, you're like, oh, controversy, fun. <laughs> so I was trying to find like his movies and I like stumbled upon like Platoon and Wall Street. And most of his other movies are like hot shots where I'm getting like a hot rod vibe. So right, I was like right. super into it. It's like, oh, this is funny. <laughs> but then I watched Platoon and I watched Wall Street and it was like this realization for me. I was like, whoa, like movies can be more than just entertaining, which is there's nothing wrong with a movie just being entertaining, but when you watch something like Wall Street, you're like, there's much more going on here than entertaining. Right, so like, like provoking and... Ex- exactly, yeah. It's the, the about society and whatnot. Philosophy, ideology, society, all that kind of stuff. And it, like, it was very apparent that it was like very personal to Oliver Stone and the filmmaker. And that's why I also was like, I watched Platoon and Wall Street and I was like, well, these made me feel very similar. And I discovered, I'm like, oh, that was the same director. And then I started learning more about what directors really did. And so it was really cool to get into that through Oliver Stone. So that, that was really neat. Nice. So what steps did you take in order to start the process of becoming a filmmaker? Uh, did you go to school? Did you, are you self-taught? Did you like become a PA somewhere? What was the process like for you? So that started in high school um, when I moved out to California where I, I, they told me like I was so far ahead that I could graduate half a year early. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that because I don't have anything to do because <laughs> I'll just be sitting around. So they're like, well, we have some film classes. So I went in and did those and it was just like, this is it. Like, I'm glad I did this because this gives me something to do. So my teachers even realized that like they would give their assignments, but it was more of just like, film your friend doing this and my teacher was like yeah Landon's not really digging this but he wants to do stuff so they would just be like yeah you can just pick whoever you want in the class and shoot what you want oh that's awesome so in the high school itself you learned how to film Mm -hmm. and edit and did you start writing your own projects as well in that Uh uh-huh because a lot of the people who I I was working with really just wanted to get out of class so they were just like happy to act in it and do stuff here and there but I was like do you want to write something they'd be like no I don't (laughs) so it's like okay so I was at not forced, but if I wanted to make projects, I was writing, directing, uh, producing, even shooting it, acting in it myself, which I would not act in anything now. Like, <laughs> very glad to be away, like, get behind <laughs> the, the camera. Scene. Yeah. But at first, it's like you want something done and you want, like, someone to say something silly, and your friends are like, I'm not going to say that. And it's like, well, I guess I have to say it. <laughs> so and then th- that's the kind of stuff. And then from there, um, I was just so into it, and I was talking to my dad because that's who I was living with, and he's like, we should just further your education in it. If you're enjoying going to school, why not? So I went to college and got a degree for it. Well, talk about those silly things that you would write that they wouldn't say. Talk about your first project that you, <laughs> that you, that you actually worked on in high school for film. Okay. So it's pretty corny, but I, I don't know. It's fun. I was really into, like, I still am, but like Tim and Eric. And so I wanted to do like a Steve Brule ripoff. Like, okay, so okay. I had a shirt because I worked at this really fun uh, burger restaurant where instead of giving you like number one or number two, we'd give you like like a uh, house MD or like Snoop Dogg or something like that. <laughs> and then we'd get on the microphone and do a little shtick. And that's how you know your food was ready. Uh, so they also did shirts 
like you know when you're in a garage that'll say something on oh, it yeah, yeah. so like i had one that said mr right and then one that said d hauser because i really <laughs> liked uh, doogie hauser uh-huh. so i was like okay what steve brule thing can i do so i came up with this came up i ripped off steve brule <laughs> and uh it was named doobie hauser and it was just like this stoner who would give you really bad advice <laughs> so like that was like the extent of my getting into filmmaking and they're funny to go back now i have them unlisted on you know oh, i don't right. want anyone seeing it but uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but they're your own private Idaho. exactly they're yeah private collection that's good my friends and i who like worked on them will go back and be like nice like good one <laughs> <laughs> hey maybe you're showing to tim and eric someday yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be like thanks for ripping us off <laughs> <laughs> and snap you with the lawsuit <laughs> probably <laughs> uh so uh what school did you go to i went to the art institute down oh. in orange county yeah. nice and um, how was that experience for you going to school for film filmmaking? Uh, it was interesting. I, I really got to learn a lot there. Just like sheer desire to get it done. Now, was, do they have a focus there? Like, did you focus on directing? Did you focus on writing? Or was it just open ended filmmaking? Is filmmaking? Yeah, as basic as possible as it could be, just to kind of get you into everything. And it was actually a little bit discouraged, like made like disciplining and something there. But I was just like, I'm not an editor. I'm not a cinematographer. You know, it's like nothing against those. They're very important things. It just wasn't for me. So right. I was like, I don't want to do this. And the, like, so you have like two directing classes and like two writing classes, but then like six editing classes. So it was just, it drove me nuts. So I spent more time like doing stuff, like trying to like continue to make shorts and direct and all that as I could. But it was, I think it was great that they did it that way. Cause I do have a better idea of how to edit now and, and stuff like that. So it helps me collaborate more, but I wish I could have like done a little bit more of a discipline. Well, you also have a lot of experience on your own. So you <laughs> yes, that <laughs> that's always fun. <laughs> Tell me about working in filmmaking in the college atmosphere. How did that work out as opposed to now you're working on your own? Is it such an easier process when it's in college or do you feel it's more limiting because it's a college institution? Um, how is that whole process? Like, do they, because the stuff you write now, you write whatever you want mm-hmm. in the school. Did they limit you when you were writing any of your projects? Uh, so it wasn't necessarily limited, but a lot of times if you were writing something, you did need to try to like make sure that your teachers would also enjoy it. So if it was like more of an abstract concept or like a darker concept or something like that, or even jokes that might not be their sense of humor, they were going to like encourage you to change it, which then, you know, that's, I think was good because probably in the future, you're going to work with people, producers and stuff like that. <laughs> who are going to be like, no, 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 change it. So it, it was a good experience. The suits. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think for me, I say like the only reason to go to film school is to take advantage of the sets. Because you're going to have cheap equipment, you're going to have cheap insurance, and you're going to have, for the most part, free help because it's your friends who are also wanting to work with you and stuff like that. So that's the best thing you can learn about it. Because if you're going to a thriving film school, there's going to be a set every weekend. Right. You know. What did you learn from working on your first film outside of college that you wish you would have learned in college? I learned to start collaborating with the people who you're going to be working with in post-production and pre-production. Because a lot of times we would jump into it with not knowing who we wanted as the editor or the composer or anything like that. And then we'd get into it and it was just like, uh, it's almost like a whole new phase of pre-production. Just bring them on board because it's like they haven't been there since day one. So they don't really, not that they don't know, but there's something more explaining that you have to do. So now I try to bring on as many people as I can that's going to be on there. Yeah, to carry through the whole project. And then when it's done, then then we're done. That's true because from what I understand, a lot of people... No production, production being the main thing, but they don't plan out post production because mm-hmm. that's some that's a totally different beast in itself. So that's good advice. Let's talk about your production company that you started, Broken Bottle Films. How did you come up with the title? <laughs> I was working at a Is piece. it a violent title? <laughs> no, everyone always asks that. Like it is in the <laughs> intro and it slams and everything. It's great. It's a great image. I love it. I think it's fun. Um it just it's attention getting like that what is it thx same thing yes, it's just like yes. out of nowhere you're like what just happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the thx they used to be nuts is but, it uh, you breaking the bottle is yes <laughs> that is me we're actually i'm hoping to refilm that soon in an actual bar i just need to find one that'll let me slam a bat on their counter <laughs> so but uh, that's usually they're like yeah you can film and i'm like this is what we're filming and then i just hear like a beep <laughs> um, but i was working at a pizza place in newport and It was like a very popular pizza place. And so famous people would come in. They'd bring wine bottles, typically their own, and they'd sign it when they're done drinking it. So we had this like 
shelf that was one that's clearly supposed to be mounted on the wall, kind of just sitting in front of the host stand where, where I was the host. And so drunk people would come up and just like lean up against it and knock these like potentially expensive signed bottles off all the time. And every time I was just like, it's going to break. And it never <laughs> did. But just seeing it break over and over, just thinking broken bottle, I was like, oh, it's fun to say. And then it <laughs> just manifested itself into that. So Nice. How did you start the production company? Did you work with someone else or did you just come up with it on your own? Uh, there's been people along the way who have stepped in and helped out where needed, but it's been mostly independent just through me. Nice. And when you started the production company, how did you get into producing? And when did you know you really wanted to write and direct your own stuff? I think I got into producing because I wanted to write and direct my own stuff. <laughs> and a lot of times it's just easier to do it yourself. I obviously love having more people and, and collaborating and stuff, but certain times if you're on a time crunch or if there's like specific things you need and it's just like, I'll just do it myself. And I've grown out of that a lot more now. I, I try to find the time and everything like that to make sure that we have other people on. But that's definitely how I got into producing because it was like, I have these ideas I want to do. No one's going to do it for me. So I, I need to do it myself. Um, talk about your writing process. Um, so a couple of the films that we're going to talk about today um, is going to be Stalled, Attendance Required, Last Day, and You're Grounded. Talk about the writing process for each of those films and where did you come up with the idea and how long did it take for you to complete them? Okay. Stalled, that's a fun one. It took me about a year to write that Which one. Which I will give you credit because I do like the twist at the end. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank that's you. Like, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everyone says. They're just like, that ending, though. And I'm like, cool, thank you. Um, that one was... Uh, it was a lot of fun and it was a really big learning experience, but that one took me like a year to write just because I, I couldn't figure out the dynamic. It was like who he needed, like that beginning with Sarah. I just couldn't figure that out. I was like, and that's so important. It's like it is only in the beginning, but, you know, it carries throughout the whole thing. So it right. took a long time and a lot of suggestions and a lot of people being like reading and reading and reading. And then finally we got something and we just started shooting. I think we shot like like almost two months later. So we got it. Mm. How did you get the location? Is that that's not Union Station, is it? Or it's a bus? It's a Santa Ana train station. Oh, Santa Ana train oh, station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was really cool. A producer yeah, for it. Looked beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. The producer for it, Ashley. We talked about it. She'd known about the script from as soon as I started writing it, and as soon as I was like, "Hey, will you produce it?" And she was like, "Sure." And I was like, "I want to shoot a real train station. I don't want to try to cheat it. I don't <laughs> want to like do a bench. I don't want to do anything like that." And she was like, "Let me see what I can do." And then we went to some train stations around, and a lot of them were not that epic, you know, where mm -hmm. they didn't have, like, places to sit. Some of them were just benches, and that's the one we found, and we were both like, we really like this. And she handled most of the muscle work on that and yeah, got it done. Watching it, it reminded me of Union Station in downtown LA, where they filmed Blade Runner. And I was like, whoa, yeah, is yeah. this the same? <laughs> yeah, I was like, pretty, it was pretty awesome. Well, that was that the, the jib shot in right. the beginning. That mm -hmm. was just blatantly ripping off Blade Runner <laughs> in, the, in the Union Station <laughs> shot. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. that that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, speaking of which... When you started Stalled, how many film projects had you worked on prior to doing that? So I had done about a handful of those Doobie Housers, <laughs> so that doesn't count. But I had shot, uh, wrote... They always count. <laughs> well, don't, don't diminish your work. That's true. It, yeah, it Doobie counts. wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah. Uh, I had, so I would shot one, co-directed and, and wrote and produced one other uh, short film before that. Like wow. One like actual like cohesive narrative that mm -hmm. wasn't just a sketch. So that was the second thing I had taken on. Wow, congrats on that. I appreciate it. And how was it finding the location? You said your producer, Ashley, helped you with that. Mm -hmm. And um, casting for the film. Where did you find your actors? Uh, actors, so it was, uh, it's a shame. Cast is what we, I used to use, like C-A-Z-T. And I heard they went out of business recently. Mm -hmm. And I'm like super bummed. But they were this really cool place. You would, you would just like send in all the information you had. You had to pay for parking. Besides that, they'd give you a room for the day, and all you had to do was make sure you reviewed everyone who came in. And then they're like, the day was free. So uh -huh. you could they would set up a camera for you and all that stuff. So that's where we did most of the auditions, and that's where we met Jose. And well, we did like a lot of auditions, but then we went three different places. But that was the main way I casted for a very long time, up until I found out they closed like, like a couple months ago. So oh, I'm, like, no. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to cast from now on. <laughs> I need to get a casting director. But So that's how we did that, and then L.A. Casting. 
Mm, and then guessing, yeah. for casting Robbie or, or the kid, that took for a really long time because nobody was doing it for me. And then Brady came in and is like, like two or like even just after his introduction, I don't even think he had started it. I was like, he doesn't even need to audition. He just like, <laughs> he's got the role. And it's been I'm glad that he came in because we've worked on numerous projects since then. We have one we're working on now, so it's it was a good relationship. I'm glad that uh, I was able to get that with him. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's uh you're having the Seth Rogen and Judd Apatow relationship <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> almost any time I'm on a project, project even if it's just like a like a like a walk online i'm just like hey brady do you want to have this part like just uh, try to work with him again he's so much never fun. have to audition again exactly exactly <laughs> that's awesome talk about the challenges on that film from set first stalled or was it a smooth ride the whole way i wouldn't say it was smooth but i also wouldn't say it was challenging it was just like things needed to get done and we just did them if that makes any sense we didn't really think like oh this is challenging but like Jose, I'm very thankful we casted him as as Joel, but we ended up going through a bunch of casting. Uh, we had cast someone originally, and they just didn't show up for rehearsals. And when I texted him, I was like, "Hey, where are you?" He's like, "I don't drive during the rain." And it was just, what? Yeah, so I was like, uh, "I'm sorry, we're Actors, gonna have, we're gonna have right? to move on." <laughs> And I didn't want to be rude about it, but I was like, I don't know what to tell you, man. I wish you could have called me. So we, we moved on to someone else, and then we got someone else, and he called the day before shooting and was like, sorry, something else came up. And so it was just like about three people, and then finally, uh, Jose, I, I called him up, and he was like, yeah, awesome. And then I'm so thankful he, he was interested because he ended up being like probably the perfect fit. Yeah, he was great. In it. So that was challenging. And then so the train station itself and the bathroom were two different locations because the train station bathroom was going to be too difficult to shoot in. The bathroom itself was at the school that I went to, and the most difficult part about that was I went in and the ba- like, you know, like the stalls. Was people trying to use the bathroom at the time. No, no, no. no. Uh, we just put a out of order <laughs> sign when we were filming. But uh, uh, we went in originally, and and you see in the movie the stalls are like this kind of grayish uh-huh. color, but it was originally like Perry the Platypus blue or Gumby like color. <laughs> and I was like, that's too goofy for the tone of this film. Right. So I asked someone at the school, and I was like. I know this is a weird question, but is it possible to like paint the stalls like a different color? And uh, the person just directly responded like, as long as we don't find out. And so it was like, all right, went to Home Depot. I got some paint, painted it. <laughs> we finished filming it and they found out and they came up to me and the security person was like, did you paint the bathroom? And I was like, yeah. And he just looks at me. He's like, why did you just admit it? Like, you didn't even try to argue. I was like, because I did. I was like, I'm not going to argue it. Like, yeah, did I did. Did you get in trouble? They uh, they were like you can either pay to have someone remove it or remove it yourself. So I spent twenty two hours in there scraping paints off the stalls, <laughs> but it was definitely worth it. I think because it it really for me did set the scene apart. Like those, it wouldn't look the same for me. It wouldn't have the same feel if it was like this gumby green, <laughs> which is a weird color to have in a restroom. Anyways, it was like, like an you're... art school, so it's like oh, colorful true. poppy colors everywhere. That's so. True. Damn Art Institute. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's kind of on them for painting it yeah. that color. <laughs> um, let's go into uh, A Tennis Required, uh, the next film. How long did it take you to write that film? And how long did it take you to complete it completely? That one, I wrote a lot quicker than I usually do. A lot of times they just sit on things and it just takes me forever to get it out. But now, this one is more dialogue heavy compared to Stone. Mm-hmm. And definitely you can hear the voices between the actors mm-hmm. or the characters, I should say. Is that something that's happened to you before? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everyone's, maybe not to that extreme, but I think everyone's been in a situation where they're in a position where they just have to be around someone that they care about, but, you know, but they can't like interact with them. And it's just super uncomfortable for everyone. So I was like, I thought that was a really relatable. But the what I really wanted to do with that was... I had worked at a restaurant in high school at a, like the one I was talking about where they gave you the fun oh, numbers. Yeah. And, and that was just such a, like a bittersweet fun thing that I wanted to try to incorporate in with this like romance drama that I was like, that's what goes on, you know, at those restaurants as well. And that's where you see it even more because you have to be around those people so often. So that's what I was really trying to achieve. And with that time period, too, I was really and I still am. He's like one of my favorites, but I was really into Paul Thomas Anderson. Like Magnolia is just such a gorgeous film. And Boogie Nights is so amazing. And I wanted to tackle an an ensemble. Mm -hmm. So I was like, "Uh, restaurant, you know, so it all just kind of came together. And I'm happy with how it turned out. But now I use it more of a proof of concept because I'm actually working to adapt that into a pilot. Oh, so actually, yeah, I could see that. That'd I think, yeah, that, that for me, when it when it ends, a lot of people are, would say to me, like, what's next? And I'm like, well, that's it. It's over. <laughs> Nothing's next. And then I was thinking about it. I'm like, no, it does kind of feel like what's next. So that would be basically that would be the first episode. And I would just try to expand upon it. 
and I've got a first draft. It's not amazing, but it's 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 closer to what I would I really would like to do with it. So that's really exciting. That's good. How long did it take you to shoot? Um, we didn't have the full budget we needed for that, so we only had I think two nights to shoot that. Wow. Yeah, two overnights. Everyone was really happy with me when I told them we're going to be shooting from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. <laughs> they wow. loved it. It might not. You I, were the, the king of the ball. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> thanks, Landon. Um, <laughs> But it, it, that was the only time we could get the restaurant, and it was a scene that took place at night. It was going to be cheaper to shoot it at night than try to you know black out the windows or try to pay extra to have the restaurant during the day or whatever. So, but we only had enough money to do for two nights, so we muscled through two nights of of long shooting. But it was a lot of fun. Did you use the same production company to cast? Yes. And that was a fun experience. The, the, probably the coolest part about that was um, meeting Lauren Faulkner because we were casting for JC and we weren't very satisfied with anyone who'd come in and we didn't get a lot of people submitting either. It was only like four or five. So after all four or five, we still had like six hours left of casting and no one else was coming in. And I was oh, like, no. I don't want to have, cause I live down uh, South, like Orange County, Costa Mesa area. So like being a little bit of a brat, I'm like, I don't want to drive up here again. I don't want to have to reschedule all this. So I just went out into the lobby and I found like actresses who were auditioning for other stuff. And I was like, Here's the script. If you'd like to audition, go ahead. Here's the script. If you'd like to audition. And I found Lauren Faulkner, and she was like, I'm available to audition right now. And I was like, yeah, cool. We, we've got the part. So that was really exciting. And then I'm working on the same project I was talking about with Brady. She's involved with it, too. Oh, so nice. it's cool to be able to work with them again. Let's move on to the next film, um, Last Day, um, The Greatest Senior Prank. Uh, <laughs> talk about where you came with the concept for that one and um, how long it took you to write it and shoot it. I didn't actually come up with that concept. My roommate at the time, Carter Thomas, when we had first met, he had written like a very like something similar to that. What I wrote was loosely based on his, and he and he gave it to me, and he's like, "What do you think?" And I was like, at the time, I was like, "There's nothing." I, I didn't really see it what he was going for, mm-hmm. and we had time to sit on it for a really long time, and then finally, I was like, I, "I think I have something. Can I can I borrow this?" And we sat down and talked about it for a little bit, and then he was like, "Yeah, go ahead and borrow it." And that's when I presented the script, and, and we went from there. Nice. How was the experience shooting while driving? I'm claustrophobic, so it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> but So backtracking, it was, uh, we had shot it twice, actually. So originally, we shot it with Carter directing, and with same cast and, and everything, and, and we watched it. We weren't comfortable with it. We were like, this isn't tonally what we're going for, because I think with what, what we're doing in that, it's kind of important that it tonally fits right. what we're trying to go for. So we ended up reshooting. And then I was directing at that time, and we had different gear, but the there you can see the one mount or shot where we have it mounted on the hood of the car mm-hmm. that broke after the first take. Oh, and no. We even had because it's like bungeed on, so we even have footage of the camera just launching towards oh. the windshield. It was a nightmare. So that's why, and I'm glad it ended up the way it did, but that's why it's such a confined feeling. We had no other angles that we could safely shoot. Like, I didn't want the, to have the cinematographer, Avery, have to sit in someone's lap or anything like that while driving. I was like, this just doesn't seem safe. So. Yeah. But it ended up the way we shot it and the final product. I liked the way it felt. Like I said, I'm claustrophobic. So we would shoot the whole thing and then park and I'd have to get out and just like uh. <laughs> just try to breathe. Like because we could, you know, no AC, no anything like that. And in this stuffy car, it's not even a full back seat. It's one of those half backs right, yeah. where you have to move yeah. the seats forward. So, yeah, it was uh, it was tedious, but <laughs> it was worth it for sure. That's good. Is that one of the only challenges in that film minus the cinematography on it? Was there any other challenges in that film or anything that you came out with like oh now i know how to do this better for the next time mm, it was one of the first short films that i had to do like a really massive adr session i didn't really have my own personal experience with that well the person who did it did a really good i guess I that's did. true because it'd be very hard to fit like a microphone in there overhead so yeah. that and then yeah we could we didn't really have much room to boom yeah and then the lavs if their seat belts on it was kind of brushing it mm. so that's something i didn't think about and we didn't really couldn't really do anything about until afterwards but so i learned like again the, getting your post people from the beginning <laughs> it's like now i just assume okay we're probably gonna have to do adr at some point so let's have someone who knows what they're doing uh, from the beginning so right. i can say <laughs> this date if we need to do it can you be available and then stuff like that so that was an interesting lesson from that that's great it's a, it's always a learning process. For sure. And let's go ahead and talk about your grounded. Okay. Talk about the concept, the writing, and the length of shooting. 
That one, very fun. Uh, we shot it a year ago, but post took a very long time. But So it feels recent. Yeah, it feels because re- I just <laughs> released it not too long ago, finally. And all the talent and everything are like, took you long enough. And I'm like, it did my best. But the process for writing that was funny. I was working for a, uh, like doing freelance for a company at the time that made like uh, security products and like other like kind of gadgets and stuff. And they needed a commercial for a security camera. And I came up with a really loose idea of someone breaks in, so they sneak out. And that was what it was. And they were like, we love this idea. Go ahead and get started on it. So I you know, wrote it out and everything. And then I sent it to them. They're like, this is awful. Get rid of it. <laughs> and I was just like, Wait, you said you liked it. They're like, not anymore. Sorry. And then so I was like, but I still kind of like this concept. So I, I, start, I just kind of scrapped their idea, took what I liked out of it and rewrote it. And a while back, they came back and they're like, can we have that story again? And it's like, <laughs> sorry, no, I have, I've, I've already taken it. But so that's where that came from. And then I, I mean, obviously, you can just tell Panic Room was inspiration. And what I like about Panic Room is it's Fincher's just like you can just tell he was having fun with that movie. Right. Because a lot of his movies have like these deep philosophical kind of things that you can drag from it. But Panic Room is just like they're in a house, uh-huh, you know. Yeah. So I wanted to do something like that that was more simple but still entertaining. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. that's where we went with it. That's awesome. Yeah. And how long did that take to shoot? That one, we had a lot more resources. So we, it took three days to do the part where she's like actually at the house oh, uh-huh. and then one night at the hotel. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So we had, I mean, obviously, if you could have more days, more the better, days. but I felt pretty comfortable. I mean, there was like one day that we didn't make our day and it was just the camera footage stuff we had to get. So that's pretty easy to do on a pickup. So, so talk about for all these films you've done, it seems like the shooting time is, is not too lengthy. Talk about having to meet deadlines for each one <laughs> and planning out the day's scheduling because I'm sure since you have a limited time within the locations and space, you have to have everything like by the time you shoot. Mm-hmm. So I'll talk about that process of planning everything out. I guess I'd say that's my favorite just because I know how important it is. I, I wouldn't say like I love planning and scheduling and budgeting <laughs> like woohoo, but I know that if I do it right and if I really focus on that or whomever the producer or the other production is, if we're all working together on that, then we're going to have the best time on set, which is very important because you don't want to be on set and be miserable because <laughs> then it just, just I feel like the product ends up being kind of miserable too. But uh the, I think the easiest way to tackle those tight schedules is making sure that those creative leads on your production, like the cinematographer, or the AD and all that are aware and even the talent, because it's like you want to make sure everyone has the room to creatively express themselves, but also let them know it's like, this is about how much room you have today. Mm-hmm. It's like, we need to try to stay within this wiggle room. I want you to still, you know, feel happy with what you're doing, but no, we have this much time to do it. And letting everyone know, because a lot of times I think it's like a mystery, like when's the next setup or when's this? And I'm, I, I try to be pretty transparent. It's like by noon, we're going to be doing this to let everyone know so that they can mentally prepare too. So yeah, sitting down with the pre-production all day, sit down with your assistant director, tell them how long you think it's going to take to do something, you know, stuff like that. Plan it out. Yeah, exactly. As much as you can. Like try to do it down to like the 30 minute. But it's tough. Like, you know, location scouting, knowing how you're going to shoot it and where you're going to shoot it, all that beforehand is super important. Now, do you rehearse with the actors prior to filming? Whenever we can. On attendance as required, we did because we had to because it was just so many, so uh, many actors. So many actors. Yeah. But on You're Grounded, I actually deliberately didn't because it was Makes like sense. more of like a hectic situation, right, even right. between like the mother and daughter because it was like a lot of arguing. So I thought it would just fit the tone a little bit better if there was that angst in the air. So now, talk about that because you also you write a lot. Of, you, you write all your scripts, mm-hmm. basically. Um, how much do you let the actors improv and come up with their own stuff? Because I felt like for attendance required, some of the stuff that <laughs> I mean, that was might have been improv or you're just a comedic genius. Way. <laughs> uh, you like both. <laughs> no, no, I don't think I'm that funny. I think I, I know in general how I want something to feel. But so when it comes to jokes, I, I or most scripts, like I, Brady mocks me now because like he'll repeat as I'm saying it. But I'm like, guys, I like to think of it as a springboard, and he'll just mock me and be like, guys, it's a springboard. But uh, it's true. It's like you see what the goal is, you see what I'm trying to go for. Now you do what you need to do with it. Now if they feel the script is what they want to say, then that's awesome. But if they're like, I feel like they would say it more like this, or what if this joke? Nine out of Make ten times, personal. Yeah, time, so. nine personal. out of ten times, if it doesn't affect like the overall tone of the movie i'm gonna say yes a lot of times that's why you hired these people too 
for them to sit down and like for your cinematographer to why aren't we shooting it this way or for your actor to be like well why doesn't he present it this way or why doesn't she do this it's like that's what they're there for collaboration exactly it's key (laughs) and it can be tough honestly especially when you you wrote it and you're directing it you get so in your own head and i I know i've been there before where you're just like no it has to be this way but that's no fun at the end of the day i know it is work and it should be treated like work but you, you should like what you're doing agreed um now let's talk about your upcoming projects Okay. Um, you have uh, your new film, Motel 32, and and, you, and you're developing in your series, Dropouts. Yes. Uh, can you talk about those? So we'll start with Dropouts because that one's a lot of fun. I'm only directing that one. And it's kind of exciting for me because it's one of the few times that I'm just stepping in as the director, not the person who wrote it or, or is also producing, and I'm just being the creative guy. I'm not having to schedule it. Having your it. vision. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't have, I'm not the one who has to look for the funding and all that, like the nightmare stuff. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm really excited for that. It's a script or a series written by Combi. He's also starring in it as the main character. You ever watch like the Seth Rogen, Judd Apatow, like Freaks and Geeks? Yeah, yeah. And it's heavily inspired by those kind of things. And I, for me, I, I'm looking forward to seeing something. If like, let's say Netflix picked it up or something, I'm looking forward to seeing something like that again. Because the last time I saw a show hey, like Amazon that, is always looking for a new Amazon Hulu. Yeah. I mean, anything. But you know, the last time I saw a show that was of that, that was willing to be a little more goofy, raunchy comedy was Love. And I really liked that show, Judd Apatow as well. But that was on FX, right? I think it was on Netflix. On oh, Netflix, actually, you're right. Um, but uh, it just there's not a big market for those, unfortunately. I I think it's because people want to play it safe. But this show is like we're gonna have fun. We're not playing. We're not gonna play it safe. So I think that's really cool and that's really exciting for me. And there's as I was reading it, there's moments where I had to just set it down and just like laugh. <laughs> and that's for me. And that you know it's gonna be if I'm, if I'm laughing that hard while reading it, you know how much fun we're gonna have on set. So, but the show's about. It's called Dropouts. It's about a, like a team of ragtag college dropouts who are trying to thrive in a college town where it's like everyone's in love with the college like stars and everything. So the main character, Rad, he catches his girlfriend with the manager of the bar he works at and quits. And the only other job he can find in town is the uh, Chinese restaurant right across the street that only <laughs> hires dropouts. And so that's where the, you know, the comedy and the hijinks and all that come out. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And talk about Motel 32. Okay, so we mentioned earlier, like, I was always too scared of horror. And so I very recently have just been like, just watch it. Even if you have trouble sleeping tonight, just watch it. Because there's so much you can learn from these brilliant movies. And they really are. It's like, and for me, it was just like, I don't like being scared. But it's like the fact that they're able to, you know, manipulate my emotions like that. So they're doing their job as a filmmaker, making interesting stuff like that. So I've just been watching more and more and more. And finally, my friend Nathan, who does a lot of writing with me, he writes for Ready to Mingle, and he was actually in Attendance as Required. We were just talking about it, and I was like, I kind of want to write a horror. Where where should I start? He's like, I don't know, pen and paper. (laughs) Pretty much. He was just like, he's not letting me come up with the excuse of, oh, no, I've never watched horror. I don't know. He's like, so just try it. And I thought that was really cool. And so I came up with the concept. And I won't go into too much detail because I don't want to, like, spoil anything but basically this guy gets uh he's a homeless guy named kenny he gets trapped in a uh, motel bathroom and he has to like try to escape as there's like person like lingering keeping him in there so it's hopefully really creepy um you know do shocking. you have like a, a idea of like the runtime for it about 15 minutes probably and so we it's originally supposed to be a short film but when meeting with the producers and everything like that we're still treating it like a short film but we're thinking of it more like a prologue for a whole feature. Oh, that's awesome. So this is just like set the tone, what we would do with it. Well, it'd be and like then, Inglorious Bastards where in like the first part of that film, is, it seems like it could be its own short film. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's a great, <laughs> that first part is amazing. It so is. hopefully it's, it compares <laughs> to that. <laughs> I believe it will. No, thank you. You're making me blush here. Um, but so that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm working with the uh, cinematographer who i really like to work with his name's avery uh, ramirez he was a cinematographer for last day and he's also coming on board for dropouts with me so i'm excited to work with him again working with some new people two great producers lizette and uh, nelson so just a lot of good a lot of really fun people who i'm looking forward to working with. now will this be under your production company uh-huh this is uh, gonna be the first film? yeah first thing broken bottle films has done since you're grounded now talk about your whole production company itself like where did you find the the crew for that to come and help you with each film that comes in. Um, is there people that you've worked in college with? Is there people you've like seen their work and they submitted their portfolio to you? How did you find other people to collaborate with in the crew? 
That can be one of the toughest things because we want to pay people as much as we can for these positions, but a lot of times it's really low budget. And so it's a lot of like, here's 50 bucks and, you know, and, and a burrito for the day. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. And, and, and we try to be as grateful as we can, but so a lot of it's people helping out, friends, favors. And then another really great resource I had is one of the old uh, academic advisors. I had at uh, AI. She works at a different college now. And when, if I ever have projects, she'll let the like freshmen who are like, don't have any projects yet. She'll like tell them. Eager to learn. Eager to learn. Yeah. And we still, again, try to pay as much as we can, but it's a lot of people who just, who have been volunteering and we're so grateful for that, that they are just willing to help. One of the most interesting collaborations I've stumbled upon was when I released stalled and, you know, I shared it on Reddit to try to get some more views. And I got like a message on Reddit and I was like, people actually message on Reddit. (laughs) And I looked and it was a composer and he was just like, Hey, I really liked your work. I'd love to work with you. And I looked at his music and I was like, this is really cool. And I, so I found him on LinkedIn. His name is Tristan Harris and we hit it off really well. And he did the music for your grounded and he's doing it for motel. So that's just like, awesome. Yeah, back to back. That's great. It was so that's cool. Great. That's yeah. Great oh, it was fantastic. We, he was sending it to me too, and he'd, he'd be like, Oh, do you have anything you want to change? Anything you. I'm like, No, <laughs> just keep doing you. You're doing so great. And I thought that was really fun. Reddit, bringing people together. Who yeah, knew? right. Not, not splitting people apart. When people, people aren't being toxic on there, they're having a good time. <laughs> Um, I noticed that you've entered your short films into film festivals. Talk about that process, entering them and the positives and negatives of entering film festivals. Well, the positives, like starting with that, because it's better to start with positive. <laughs> you know, like this December or previous December, Stalled actually was screening in London, and that was like super exciting. That's like, awesome. People around the world are seeing international. It. Yeah, <laughs> right. It was just like wait, what? Really? People want to see this? That's so cool. And it's really rewarding and thrilling when you do get picked up and stuff. And when people do acknowledge your hard work, for every one yes you get, there's about 20 no's that are just like, you know, in the back of your head. So I think that's really important for anyone trying to submit to festivals. And just to know that your film might not, or your short film is not bad. It's just not, you know, the judge's taste or something like that. So don't get discouraged if you're getting no's and no's and no's because eventually someone's going to watch it and be like, whoa, this is totally for me. And you know what I mean? And that's, that's, and then it'll get picked up and, and stuff like that. So. And there's always film festivals everywhere. Exactly. And, so and they're so nichey too. Like, I don't know if your main character is wearing a yellow shirt. I bet there's a film festival <laughs> somewhere for main characters wearing yellow. yellow you know, like they're so, so, so you know, like spe- oddly specific. Like even for specific cameras. Like if you're shooting on like a certain like Black Magic something, I bet there's a Black Magic. You know, so yeah. Like I know there's a road mic um, from fast. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So. All you have to do is use a road mic road and mic, have yeah. pictures of it. So it's like it, it. It's not just just keep keep looking is all you have to do. Awesome. Now, you talked about your budgets and you want to pay as many people as you can. What do you do to fundraise? That's a good question. A lot of times it's... Is the producers bringing the money in? No. <laughs> well, the producer is me. Looking yeah. at you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I, I work a couple extra hours a week and stuff like that. I'll maybe ask family and friends if they have 10 bucks here and there. They can donate and just save as much as I can. But have actually... You, with, have you ever done crowdfunding? I have. Uh-huh. I did it for... You're grounded and attendance, and we we were able to raise a decent amount of money. But not having a following, you're mostly just asking your family and friends. Basically. And after two or three times, they're like, how many times are you going to ask us for money? <laughs> so I try to do it as much as I can, like save up my own money. But actually for Motel 32, Nelson uh, is stepping in as executive producer, and he's helping out financially. So that's the, like a thrill. Score. Yeah. <laughs> so it's cool to yeah, having someone yeah, that, that I think – what's cool about that is having someone who sees the vision, and it's not just like – your mom or dad helping out. It's someone else like, I know I want to be a part of this, which is thankful. Thank you, mom and dad. (laughs) I'm not saying, yeah, appreciate it, but But, it's cool to have someone outside of the family or or your little (laughs) circle who's like, no, I get it. So that's exciting. Well, hopefully someone listening will go ahead and and help out somehow. Oh, I hope so. (laughs) Just watch it. You know, that's helping enough. Just, just taking the the time and and watching something, you know. And currently where can uh, people want to see your work in film festivals or are you having screenings of anything of your work lately? Um, Where can they watch it or where can they see it? If it's not in a festival and the festival hasn't asked me to make it private, I try to keep it up on Vimeo and YouTube. So if you type in Landon Coates 
on Google, first thing that's going to come up is some kid in Idaho who plays football. But the next thing that's going to come up <laughs> the is going to... thing? Are yeah, you sure? Yeah. No, I check. Because he might have a fan page now. <laughs> no, that's what I think it is. It's like he's in football. So it's like that's so much cooler, you know? It's like that is a following. So, uh, no. So you, you just type in Landing Coats or just the name of the project. So a lot of the talent who worked on it too, I, I have it on there. So if like you type in Brady Lindsay or Jose Rossetti or anything like that, you should be able to find it as well. Nice. Go watch the films and you could understand what we're talking about. Exactly. Because <laughs> uh, we try to be as vague. We don't want to give plot points away. Any last minute advice you'd like to give our listeners um, about the process of filmmaking, stuff you've learned, stuff that um, you wish you would have learned prior to working on a certain film project that you want to uh, let them know? I guess the two. I guess the two most important things would be, for one, it's corny, but you really have to believe in yourself. You can't expect, to, especially as the director, to go on set and have people be like, you can do it. It's like they're looking for you to be like, what do we do? Not, you know, so it's like you just have to just go in and be like confident, even if you're not. Just be like, no, I am confident. <laughs> and then get home and cry if you want to. But you just – so that like, – I just really just – you got to believe in yourself. And it's – I get, you it's mean corny, you don't have a, but... a crying room when you film? Uh, we don't going... have the budget for that yet. <laughs> eventually, I will for sure. That's standard, right? Like, um, but eventually, uh, but yeah. That so you just got to believe in yourself, and then two. And I wish I'd learned this a lot earlier. You got to be willing to collaborate as much as you can. So, like, fake elitist or pretentious. When I say I took Ron Howard's master class, but I, I just paid sixty bucks and you know got to take his class. But in his master class, one of the like the coolest things, and you wouldn't. I mean, maybe others might have thought of that, but he was just talking about. He's like, some of the best decisions have come, come on the movies that I've made are from other people. And it's like, wow, like you, someone that big is saying, listen to other people. Then yeah, I should probably listen to other people. So I wish I had learned that quicker. Now it just makes it a lot easier too, and just like letting. Do letting everyone do what they think they need to do, and, and if you've given enough direction, then it's usually what needs to be done. So be confident, be, believe in yourself, and collaborate. That's what I would say. That's some great advice there. Talk about some of your favorite films. I know you talked about Hot Rod, and uh, <laughs> but uh, for any movies as, as of late that you've enjoyed, any favorite films that you want to talk about? So, like, by far my favorite film of all time, and it's undisputed, is Steve Jobs, Danny Boyle's 2015 movie. We love that movie. Oh, man, nobody saw it. And it's, like, yeah, it not, not knocking the Ashton Kutcher one. It had its moments, but it's because I think that you, one you was... You can knock it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we allow it here. Okay. Well, it wasn't amazing. And I think a lot of people just had that bad taste in their mouth, and they're like, I don't want another Steve Jobs movie, and didn't see it. And it shame on them, because it was just so good. Like, I say it was, like, a master class in just filmmaking. Like, yeah, every Danny aspect. Boyle is one of my favorite directors. Absolutely. Who and, are some of your favorite directors? Well, actually, continue, continue <laughs> to that, and then, then we'll talk about directors. Um, th- yeah, th- that movie just blew me out of the water first time I saw it, too. And I even showed up late, and I missed that, that intro with um, the author of 2001. Oh, yeah. I yeah. can't remember what it is, but that intro, like, I, so I saw it as they're already, like, fix it. And so then I came and watched it a second time. I was like, wait, this wasn't it the first time. It's like, oh, it's because you were late. But it was like <laughs> such an interesting way to start a movie yeah. with like something that's basically a guy predicting ex- every- everything Steve Jobs tried to do. And what was so great, again, about that movie is biopics are so corny a lot of times. They and this are. movie is like, we're not going to be corny. We're not even really going to be a biopic. <laughs> yeah. So that was great. Um, more recently, Vice, I guess for a lot of the same reasons, blew me out of the water. I, yeah, I love Vice. And I love that the story mechanism that they use in that film which uh-huh. is just it was great i loved it it was so like a lot of the metaphors and, and visual metaphors and stuff they were using were so simple but they were so well crafted that it's like wow yeah uh, where they just they're speaking shakespeare <laughs> yeah and, and then um, in the middle of the film it goes there you see the credits and it's, <laughs> it's great yeah i agree i was I when because I, I saw it in texas when i saw it so i was the only one laughing for most of the movie <laughs> i bet but during the credits part i'm literally crying me too and everyone's I like, like, this is, like this is fucking brilliant oh yeah this is so genius i was uh, so funny and even my mom's like staring at me like what is so funny and i was like just never it says it just it, it's okay <laughs> so that was a great one you know, then, then there's just like the Givens, like Seven, Donnie Darko, uh, Silence of the Lambs. So those are one. And Bruges, all day. I love In Bruges. And Bruges is Bruges. I say it wrong all the time. But uh, the Martin McDonough film. You're Texan. Yeah. yeah. We forgive you. Yeah. We do our best. Like <laughs> They don't teach English there. And so they teach Texan. Texan. So it's, it's really hard to transition from state to state. I still get made fun of for saying y'all, but it's like, I can't help it. It's just second nature. Well, once um, you start saying dude or... 
or like a lot, then you know you're Californian. But then I'll say, like, y'all dudes. And then it's just like, whoa, what's going on here? It's, um, a, it's a hybrid. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, there's just so many good movies. Paris, Texas, is, I really enjoy that one. It's I could just go on forever. And I feel like I'm going to wrong some movies by not mentioning them. But uh, I just love it's so okay. many. It's okay. You'll go in your cry later. Yeah, exactly. In the cry room. <laughs> Um, um, do you want to promote any of uh, any social media of your films where they can follow you? Um, any anything you like to promote? A website of your work? Okay, yeah. Um, the most like consolidated place to find all my work would just be like landingcoats dot com, and then you just go to portfolio. And then if you are interested in what I'm up to, it's not a lot, but you can follow me at Coats Magoats. That's C O A T S nice. Magoats. I didn't come up with it. <laughs> I have to I have to be transparent on that. I'm not that clever. But uh <laughs> so you could follow me there and or um check out at Ready to Mingle series. That's the series I'm working on with Brady and uh and Lauren and Avery, so it's really fun. But yeah, the, that's I'm not really. I just deleted my Twitter recently, uh, so I'm not really on too much social media. But at Coats Magoats can get you to most of it. <laughs> and yeah, then just landingcoats.com to find everything else. Awesome! Thank you so much, Landon. This sure is thing. great. Any last minute things you like to add that we might have not touched on that you Did want? We to still touch on? want to talk about directors. Or oh yes, uh, tell me some of your favorite directors. I, it always changes, like number one or number two. But I'd say like number one for the longest time now, has been Paul Thomas Anderson. Love him. I, even the movies of his that I'm like, this isn't my favorite one. There's still so much you can learn from it. So that's like really great Ooh, about him. To, to find out which ones. Uh, Inherit Vice? Yeah, well, that's just a given. Cause I, <laughs> I, but I was talking to my... Not that it was bad, but right. it was just... I, I was talking to my friend, Sean. He was a cinematographer for Stalled and You're Grounded. And, and we went and saw a special screening of... Um, pun, uh, not Punch Drunk Love, I wish. Of... Uh, phantom thread and oh. i actually got to meet paul afterwards and oh. everything and i rarely get starstruck but we're up front and i'm asking him to sign my copy of punch drunk love and i'm just like do you, do you sign like, <laughs> you know i just sounded like an idiot but he's like so friendly he signs it hands it back to me and then grabs it out of my hand again and i was like what and then he, it's the the cover where it's barry's profile uh -huh. and he had a drew a little heart bubble coming out of uh, barry's mouth and i was like oh that's so funny <laughs> but so yeah we, on the way home we were talking about inherent vice and sean's like i didn't I think a movie is just too smart for like its own good. He's like, because I didn't really fully get it. And I was telling him I didn't get it. And I think that's why most people don't like it. It's, it might just be too smart. But uh, but not that it's a bad movie. But yeah, so that's for, with him. Like, I love all of his What did you think work. of Phantom Thread? I liked Phantom Thread. Yeah, I it, actually really liked Phantom Thread too. It was gorgeous. It was interesting to see him do a movie without Robert Elswit. So I'm sure that was like a challenge for him too. So right. it was for, if anything, it was just cool to see a movie where he challenged himself. So there's yeah, there's Paul Thomas Anderson. I'm in love with Ron Howard lately. Um, just like movies like Rush and yeah. uh, Frost Nixon, all those love kind of Frost things. Nixon, are just yeah. Brilliant. And like he, some of his movies are cornier than others, but he's really good with biopics because they don't typically follow those those biopic tropes. Right. So I enjoy that. So there's Howard uh, Fincher, P. T. Anderson, Jonathan Demme. There's so many good ones. Uh, Sofia Coppola. Like, love lost in translation. Um, so there's just so many. It's hard to list. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Landon, for being on the show. Make sure to follow us on our website, moviemenupodcast.com. You can follow us on social media at Movie Menu Podcast everywhere. And you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Make sure to subscribe. Once again, thank you so much, Landon. Thank you. We appreciate you being on here as always. And until next time, this is Movie Menu Interviews. Thank you and goodbye.